Tonight, we continue in our study in the book of Revelation. And tonight, we will be in chapter 5. And we'll do uh, what we did last week. We'll read the whole chapter and then go back through and talk about it as we uh, go through the study. So we're going to read that here in just a minute. But here is the thing I want us to do. If Stacy would, if he'll go ahead and show us our timeline, just to remind us of where we're at uh, in the grand scheme of things. Uh, we see that the church age, which is now, that was basically Revelation 1 through 3. We've read, and so that's the church age. Up until now, the very next thing on the prophetic calendar is the rapture. We'll talk a little bit more about that tonight. Uh, but the rapture is the taking out of the church from this world. Those that are true believers in Christ will be taken out of this world by Christ and taken to heaven. Uh, they'll experience the judgment seat of Christ, which is us being judged for what we did with what we've been given in this world, uh, the gospel, our time, talents, everything that we have. Uh, but after the rapture, that starts seven years of the tribulation. And the tri tribulation are uh, ten or seven years of uh, just continual uh, judgment on earth or against humanity because of their rejection of Christ and their uh, their rejection of God. And after that, we see the glorious appearing. But right now, where we're at in the book of Revelation is just after the rapture. And remember, we're going to be talking about how there are things that happen in the book of Revelation. Some things happen in heaven. And when those things happen in heaven, there's a, a corresponding event on earth. We'll really start to see that next week. The build up to that is this week, or I mean, the next time we're together uh, for this study. And so uh, this week we're going to be looking at uh, the, the scroll and, and starting to learn a little bit about that. But before we uh, go any further, we're going to go ahead and read Revelation chapter 5. And we're going to read all of it and then we're going to go back and dig into uh, what the, the scriptures are saying so. Uh, I'm as I said. I am in rev uh, in reading from the NIV because that's what the commentary that we're using uh, is coming from. And so we are going to read Revelation chapter five, and beginning with verse one, it says, "Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals." And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne, and when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls of in, uh, full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousands time, times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. And so right here we see that there is a, uh, a lot of symbolism. There is some, uh, some unique uh, attributes uh, that we see 
uh, as far as the uh, the images that we have. And so we've got a few pictures. I told you that as I am able to share with you artist renditions of what are mentioned in the scriptures, I'm going to do so so as to help us sort of visualize what John saw or what he explains in uh, his writing. And so Stacy, go ahead and show us the first one. He talks about a, uh, a lamb with seven horns and seven eyes. Uh, a lamb that looks as if it has been slain. And, uh, you know, it's, that, that is a, a hard image for us to really grasp because at most a lamb might would have two horns, uh, generally, and two eyes. Uh, go ahead and show us the next picture, Stacy. This is another one with the seven eyes and the seven horns. Uh, it's hard to see in that picture, but the way that they would generally sacrifice uh, and bleed out an animal for an animal sacrifice is they would cut the throat and uh, bleed the animal out so that it would be quick and pain, as painless as possible. And that is in that image, but you also see that that lamb is there with the scroll. Uh, go ahead and show us the next one, Stacy. This is, you know, we, we talk about the seven seals on the scroll. Now, certain translations, like the King James Version, says book, but in John's day, there was no uh, understanding of a book as we understand it. Uh, they didn't have a flat book with you know pages and a, a binder and all those sort of uh, things. What they had was a scroll made out of papyrus or other materials. And so when it says book or scroll, that's what it's meaning it's talking about a scroll but this scroll had seven seals on it that he saw and we we get the image of it being handed from the one who is on the throne to the lamb and then i think we got one more image of the scroll uh and this one you know is more reminiscent of what the jews had in the temple and that that particular image uh shares those sorts of things and so as we get started tonight uh we're going to start digging into talking about this uh, these images and some of the things that uh, we have uh, talked about uh, already by reading the, the text tonight. And, uh, you know, he's talking about this seven sealed scroll. And we start off trying to keep a few things in mind. And that is, first off, that John starts off, as it says in your, uh, in your notes, that he starts off with the word then. And the reason he does that, the reason he starts off with the word then as your first uh, fill in there, the reason he does that is simply because uh, the events that happened in chapter 4 follow up with the events that we read about in chapter 5. I know that sounds very elementary, but there's no hidden meaning here. He's basically saying he saw the throne room of God after he was raptured in this vision he sees the throne of God. He sees the four creatures. He sees the 24 elders. And the next thing is that then his, his attention is focused somewhere else. He's no longer captivated by the elders and the creatures and the, uh, the one on the throne. Now he sees this scroll and he's, he's, in, he's captivated by this. Now, as I said, uh, some translations of the Bible, especially the King James Version, talks about the scroll being a book. But really what we're looking at here is that uh, what God has in his hand uh, is a book rather than a scroll. Okay, uh, And that, that's just the reality of the matter. The book, wasn't, the book as we know it with pages and a, and a binding and a cover was not, was not used or invented for uh, hundreds of years uh, after this. And so uh, we see that uh, what he's talking about is a, uh, a particular scroll. Now, as we're reading through uh, the text in Revelation chapter 5, we see that um, there is uh, a, this scroll is, is mentioned. This scroll is, as it says there, it says, uh, Then I saw the right hand of him who sits on the throne, uh, on the throne, a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. So the one sitting on the throne that we know is God has in his hand that scroll with the seven seals on it. And then what they do is there's a, an angel that proclaims, you know, who is worthy to open this up? Who in heaven, on earth, under the earth, who is worthy to break open the seal of this, uh, this scroll? And no one is found. There's no one that is found that can, uh, that can do this. No one can 
uh, can break open the seal. No one's found to be worthy. And so John begins to weep because of this. Now, as you see there in your notes, the angel in Revelation uh, chapter 5 is looking for someone who is worthy to open that scroll. And they're looking not for an angel. They're not looking for a seraphim or a cherubim, but they are looking for someone to open it that is human. And so as we look, we'll see who is worthy to open that scroll here in just a few minutes. But it wasn't one in heaven such as an angel or any kind. What, he, what the, the angel is looking for is a human who, can, who is worthy to open it. Now, what this means is that whatever is contained in the scroll has some really important ramifications. And what that is, is that it has to do with uh, human beings and their re relationship to the earth. Because of what we read about in this uh, particular part of the text, we see that, that it has to do, as the author says, something to do with human beings, because it has to be a human who opens the scroll, but it also has to do with the earth because of the ramifications of what this scroll and the breaking of these seals do to the earth. Okay, And so we'll, we'll read about all of that here in a few minutes. He says, in John, I mean, John writes in verse four, I wept and wept because there was no one who was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has triumphed. He is able to, uh, to open the scroll and the seven seals. And so what we see here is that John is weeping and to understand why John is weeping and what this particular scroll has to do with uh, we have to look at a, a few things from the writings of the uh, from the prophet Jeremiah. Okay, and so Stacy, if you'll go ahead and go to the next one uh, in the book uh, in the commentary that we're using, uh, Tim LaHaye uses uh, references uh, some things talking about the uh, the writings of Jeremiah. One was that God had a warning for the people of Israel through the prophet Jeremiah, saying, basically, look, if you do not follow me, if you do not listen to what the prophet Jeremiah tells you that I have asked him to share with you. If you don't follow, you're going to go for 70 years into uh, captivity in Babylon. And so Jeremiah warns them. He writes and he, he pleads with them and he tries to get them to understand that Jeremiah is basically the last of the prophets before Babylon comes and takes Israel uh, out of their homeland and takes them back to Babylon. And so Jeremiah, as we read about in the book, uh, Jeremiah in chapter 32 of Jeremiah, he talks about uh, buying some land. And he goes and he buys this land. And what this does is this purchase of land in the book of Jeremiah helps us to understand what this scroll is all about. Okay, And so as we read about it, uh, the, the Babylonians are about to overtake Israel. And so the land that Jeremiah is looking to buy is about to be completely worthless. Yet he goes ahead and he buys it. And he goes through all of the legal proceedings that he needs to go through to buy this property. He buys it. He gets a deed just like we would get today. He gets it notarized, if you want to look at it in that regard, by the ones that would be able to notarize documents, so to speak. Uh, this was basically it being witnessed by people at the city gate and things like that. And so he, he does this, and uh, as he does it, he purchases all of this and puts it into a, an earthen jar, a, basically a piece of pottery, and he seals it up to protect the deed so that his future kin could take that deed and claim the property when Israel comes back from Babylon 70 years later. Because Jeremiah realized he would never see the 70 years end and come back to Israel. And so he bought this basically as a retirement plan or a future uh, deed of trust for his family. And so what does all of this have to do with John? Well, it's kind of interesting because when you read in uh, our commentary that we are using, uh, we see that John is, is, is weeping over the fact that no one is found that can open this scroll in heaven. Well, that scroll is basically similar to what, jo what Jeremiah had put into that jar all them years before. It was the scroll in heaven is basically a deed to the earth. 
okay, to all of the earth, not just Israel, the entire earth. There's a chapter, or I mean a paragraph here I want to read to you from this that will help make it all, all make sense, okay? And so here's what he says. He says, for all intents and purposes, the seven sealed scroll is the title deed to the earth. This title deed was given by God to Adam. Okay, now, not literally, but, you know, figuratively. Okay, and so it was given to Adam who lost it through sin to Satan. So basically, Satan holds the deed to the earth at this point. He has free reign to do what he wants to with the earth. It's no different than the property that you own. If you want to go out there and dig a big hole in your backyard, uh, according to zoning, perp- uh, zoning ordinances, basically you can do what you want to with your own property. Well, Satan is able to do the same thing with the earth, so to speak. He's able to cause havoc and wreak trouble all across the globe because he's basically holding the the title deed to the earth and for that reason and here i'm getting back to what the paragraph says it says for that reason satan is in control of the world from the time of adam until the glorious appearing of christ okay now remember that's after the seven years of the tribulation when jesus uh, comes back in all of his glory and satan is bound and put in the abyss or prison for a thousand years so basically from the time of adam until jesus returns at the glorious appearing satan has free reign of the place because well he's got the title deed so to speak but here's what it goes on to say it says john weeps as we read about in revelation 5 because he knows that this scroll represents the title deed to the earth and that as long as it is left sealed satan will remain in control of the earth and so basically what we see is that what the reason john is upset is because he realizes that through uh not being able to find someone who can break the seals on that scroll satan is still able to do what he wants to to impact humanity and keep them captive in sin and so john is is weeping because of that he's upset because of the fact that no one has been found who can break Satan's stranglehold on the earth. But as you see in your notes, the next thing we see is that someone who is worthy is found. And so John sees this unusual sight that we read about in verses 5 and 6, uh, where it says, uh, look at verses 5 and 6, it says, Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all of the earth. And so now someone is found who is worthy to start cracking open those seals to put an end to Satan's reign on the earth. And who is it? It's the line of the tribe of Judah. It is the lamb that was slain from the foundations of the earth for the sins of mankind. And so as we see uh, going through this, we see that the the lion lamb is the one who is worthy to open those uh, seals. And so the first thing that we see in verse 5 is the descriptions of what he sees. The first is the line of the tribe of Judah. And this is something that we hear in songs. It is something that we read about here in the scripture. But we know that the lion is the king of beasts, king of the jungle, however you want to look at it. But the lion is the top dog in the food chain, so to speak. He is the, the, the powerful beast. He's the king of animals. But also Judah is the ruling tribe in the nation of Israel. King David came from the tribe of Judah. And we see that this is uh, where this lion slash lamb was to come from. And we see that in verse 5. But then second, we see the root of David. And what this means is, and we, I'm, not, I'm not surprising anybody or uh, ruining anything for you by saying that the lion and the lamb is Jesus. Okay, I realize that I'm not. Uh, If I am, I'm sorry that I just ruined the surprise for you. Uh, But nevertheless, we know that the lion or the lamb is Christ. And what we see here is that he is the root of David, meaning that he finds his root in the family line of David. 
If you look at the family lineage in Luke and in Matthew, one follows John's, I'm not John, I'm sorry. One follows Joseph's family line and the other follows Mary's family line and both of those go back through the line of David. Meaning that Jesus' earthly parents found their lineage in, uh, in the line of David, but he also finds his lineage uh, as being in the line of David because we're told that the king, the Messiah that would come, would come from the line of David, but he would also uh, be eternal. And we have all these other descriptions of Christ in that regard. Uh, the third thing that John describes is he sees a lamb looking as if it has been had been slain. And basically what we see here is another symbolism of Christ being the lamb that was slain from the foundations of the earth, as the scriptures say, that was slain, meaning that Christ was the lamb that was sacrificed for our sins. And so John sees not only this, you know, this line of the tribe of Judah, but this lamb that has been slain. Now, if he saw Jesus, now let me, let me, if he saw Jesus and just described Jesus in this way, that's one thing. But there is some real symbolism here in what he says, obviously. So it gives us the impression that this is what he saw, was the lion and the lamb, so to speak. But he also talks about this lamb uh, having seven horns. And in the scriptures, horns are uh, in the Old Testament and even here into the New Testament, the, a horn is symbolic of power. It's, uh, you know, we, if you think back to the visions of uh, Daniel, there's visions of horns in those uh, animals that he sees in his, uh, in his visions. And even here, this is a very powerful, powerful lamb. Even though this is a lamb that's been slain, a lamb that has died for the sins of mankind, very powerful. And then he also talks about seeing the seven eyes, which are the seven spirits, of God sent out into all the world. And, and basically what we see here is that as it says there in your notes that this uh, represents the judgment of our Lord including the seven characteristics of the Holy Spirit. And we talked about that last time. Uh, talking about the, the seven spirits that are before the throne are not seven individual spirits but instead the characteristics of the Holy Spirit. And so this is leading to this judgment that God is going to do. Those seven eyes uh, represent as well that judgment that will uh, that will occur through the tribulation and uh, as Jesus does his uh, judgment. But see, as it says there in your notes, Revelation 5, 7, and 8 tells us that when John sees Jesus take that scroll from the hand of God, that the four living creatures and the 24 elders that we talked about last week, they fell down and they worshipped him. And that's what they did. They, they see Jesus reach to the hand of God, as we would understand it, and he takes from the hand of God this scroll because Jesus is the only one that is worthy to crack open the seal on the title deed of the earth. Well, you remember that thing that we said a few minutes ago that we had to look for someone who was human? This goes to show us again that Christ is 100% God and 100% human all at the same time. We don't understand how, we, how God made it work, but some way God was able to make in the flesh, He was able to contain the glory of the eternal God in human flesh. And Jesus was, beyond our understanding, still He was 100% man, 100% God. And we see right here, this, this proves the fact that He was man that he was 100% human because he was able to receive this. He was worthy, and that was what was needed. So John tells us here, though, about two things uh, in the hands of the, the ones that are worshiping God in heaven, and it gives us a little bit more of an understanding about heaven and even about our own faith to some degree. Because look at the, the first thing in your notes there. It says, uh, they have in one hand a harp. Now, we, you know, usually when we look at the cartoons or images, 
you see the angels there holding the harp and they're, they're playing the harp and they've got the wings and all of that. But what we see here in the Scriptures is that that's not the angels, that instead that is the 24 elders that we, you know, we believe are uh, humans that are, uh, are mankind that have, uh, been, have died and are in heaven. And so this gives us a little bit of an understanding of what kind of, in, uh, what kind of music will be in heaven. Okay, So uh, basically what we're being told is there's going to be stringed instruments in heaven. Uh, we're going to have harps in heaven. Uh, now, uh, how, those, how loudly those harps are played or how softly they're played, we're not told. But nevertheless, we're told that there will be harps in heaven. Uh, secondly, the other thing that they have, they have in one hand they have a harp, and in the other hand they have golden bowls that are filled with the prayers of the saints. And so basically what this is telling us is that the uh, 24 elders are holding in their hands, and the creatures, they're holding in their hands these bowls that have the prayers of the saints. And what that sort of gives us uh, some uh, idea of is that these prayers uh, may be, I mean, we're not told what those prayers are, but probably, most likely, possibly, those could be unanswered prayers of saints uh, uh, directed to God and obviously being held by these uh, leaders in heaven, if you want to call it now. It says here that these prayers are believed to be some of the prayers of believers who are converted and survived the tribulation. Okay, because what we're going to see is that after the rapture, there is going to be a great revival of, not I say not revival, there is going to be a great evangelistic effort during the tribulation to win souls for Christ. And until Christ returns at the glorious appearing, what we see in the scriptures is that there will be an opportunity for people to continue to be saved because there are going to be people preaching the gospel. And if the gospel is being preached, that means people are able to be saved. And so what we'll see is that during that time, uh, people are going to come to faith. Now, many of those are going to die because of their faith. They're going to be martyred because of their faith during the tribulation by the Antichrist and by others, disease, famine, things like that. But what we, what we need to understand from this is that those people who were saved during the tribulation, during those seven years, those individuals, like believers ought to even now, ought, they will be praying. And what we see is that those bowls that the 24 elders and the creatures will be holding in their hands, possibly, quite probably, will be the prayers of those people that have been converted to Christianity during the tribulation. And so uh, we'll see, that, uh, see how that plays out going forward because there'll be some more description and more talk about those that become Christians during the tribulation later. Now, what we, as we continue to read, we see that uh, the angels, uh, not only the angels, but uh, there are some songs that are sung here in what, we, uh, what we're looking at. And one of the things we see in verse 9 is that uh, there is a, a song that is sung, and we get a little bit of a description of uh, why Jesus is worthy uh, to crack open the seal on this uh, title deed of the earth. And the first one is from verse 9 uh, is because he was because he was slain. Because he died for our sins, he is able uh, to do that. And this, this refers to Jesus' death on the cross. Uh, because he was slain. Because he died for the sins of mankind. Another reason that he is worthy is uh, as it says there in verse 9, with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. That is a powerful, powerful image for us when we think about it. That through the blood of Christ, He has, he has ransomed, He has redeemed, He has purchased people from all over the globe. From every tribe, every language, every people, and every nation. You know, you heard us share when we got back from Honduras about how uh, when we were there, they were singing hymns that we knew, and they were singing in Spanish, and we were trying to sing it in English. And uh, you know, as we were singing, it was a it was a very small glimpse of what we see here 
as we start to see images in Revelation, that's what we were witnessing there was, uh, you know, no matter of color or creed or uh, no, no matter the language, we saw that we were singing and worshiping God together. And, it's always, and that's a, a, a very visual image of that. But then the third reason that we see that he was, uh, that he was uh, worthy is that it says in verse 10, you have made them to be a kingdom and priest to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. And so we see that, uh, that those that are saved, those that have a relationship with Christ become a part of the kingdom of God. And as he references here, priests that are going to serve God, we're, that's one of the things that people don't know. You know, people think a lot of times that when we go to heaven, we're just going to sit around on a bunch of clouds and just be happy all the time and we're not going to be doing anything. But the Scriptures tell us that there's at least two things we're going to do. One is we're going to worship God. Second of all, we're going to serve Him. And so uh, we, we need to be about worshiping Him today and we need to be about serving Him today. And because we need to practice now for what we're going to be doing for eternity. Uh, you know, I'd like to hope that I, by then I'm a little better at it than I am now. Uh, just because of worship and serving Him now. And so, uh, but you notice that it says, and they will reign on the earth. That's giving us a glimpse and an understanding of where we are in the timeline of the uh, of the rapture and the tribulation. You remember that we talked uh, the past couple of times about how some people think that the rapture will happen at other times, not at the very beginning of the tribulation. Well, this shows us that it won't happen any other time other than at the beginning of the tribulation. The rapture won't because when would the things such as the judgment seat of Christ and these other things occur if it happens at the glorious appearing? If it happens at the glorious appearing, we wouldn't be able to rule and reign with God like we are going to be able to because we would have to experience the judgment seat of Christ and other things like that. Now, one of the final things we have to look at tonight is the description of Christ by the angels in verses 11 and 12. Because right here, the angels are the ones who know Christ the best. They have spent eternity with Him since uh, the creation of angels. Uh, and they give us a good description of Him. And so they describe Him as, as being worthy to receive seven things. And so Stacy, if you'll go ahead and put those seven things up there. I'm going to let you copy those down uh, as we're talking. Uh, but they're saying that Jesus is worthy to receive power. And we see those seven horns on that lamb. So yeah, He's worthy and He has, uh, has that power. We also see that uh, in verses 11 and 12, they mention wealth and wisdom, strength, and probably some of the more important ones, honor, glory, and blessing. And so this is a very powerful description of Christ in uh, these in verses 11 and 12. Because you know, it says there in verse 11, Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand. Basically what John is telling us right there is, there was no way to count the number of angels in heaven. That's just, it's you know, limitless. You know, it's just infinite number of angels. And so remember the image that we saw last time. There's the throne there are the 24 elders around the throne. There are the four creatures that are, are responsible for nothing but worshiping God 24-7. Uh, and then uh, surrounding them in heaven is a limitless number of angels which are doing nothing but worshiping God and telling us how worthy Christ is. But they tell us about, uh, about those things. They tell us that Christ is... Uh, you know, they give us a good description of him there and help us to really get a, a better understanding of who Christ is and, and what he is worthy of because of who he is. He's worthy of that power and wealth, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. And so we see that description uh, and uh, that sort of fades from verses 11 and 12 uh, into verses 13 and 14. And I'm going to give you just a minute to finish writing those. I know that's a lot to try and uh, copy down. 
But we, we start to transition into this, uh, in verses 13 and 14, this universal worship of Christ. And that's what we see. And, and what, we're, what we're basically getting is a glimpse of the fact that at a future time, at, you know, at a time in the future, uh, all of creation will bow and worship Jesus as Lord and Savior. And uh, you know, it, it's a good reference to uh, Philippians 2.9. Uh, where we see uh, you know, that, that Paul does a, a great job of writing. He said, this is what he says. And this is a picture of, as it says in your notes, creation and uh, how creation is worshiping Christ. Uh, in Philippians 2 is similar to what we read about here. But it says in Philippians 2, 9, it says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven, and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And see, listen to what, that's what Philippians says. That's what Paul wrote. But here is what John wrote some 30 plus years later, watching worship in heaven. He says, Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. So John sees this vision of Jesus being worshipped by everybody. Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, records basically the same thing. So what that is telling us is that at some point in eternity, in the future, there will be a time where every knee of every created being in all of creation, man, demon, angel, everything, will bow at the name of Jesus. Will bow before Him. Now, for those of us that are Christians, we're going to be bowing very willfully. We're going to be doing it out of a love for the one who has saved our souls. There will be very prideful men and women who will not want to bend that knee and bow before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, but guess what? don't really matter what they want to do because He's the only one that is worthy of the worship and the praise. And regardless of how prideful and how strong-willed and whatever you want to call it, they will bow whether they like it or not. That's not Pastor Nick being mean. That's the Word of God telling us what's going to happen. And we just have to realize that we can either do it out of a love and devotion for the one who has died, who was slain for us, or we can do it out of being forced by the God of the universe. And so we see that there is this uh, worship that will happen. Uh, the final thing to mention to you tonight, and this is where we're going to wrap up, is, uh, if you'll go ahead and go to the next slide, is talking about the tribulation period. Now, chapter 13 in the Black Book in the, in the commentary. Chapter 13 talks about the tribulation period. It talks about Daniel and the 70 weeks of Daniel and, and all of that. And basically what I, I'm going to, I'm going to give you the Reader's Digest version. Okay. For us younger folks, that's the Cliff Notes version. Okay. Uh, we're going to give you the Reader's Digest version of what he says in that chapter 13. I want you to read it because it's important for you to understand how the book of Daniel relates to the book of Revelation, okay? But basically what happens is in the book of, Re in the book of Daniel, Daniel prophesies about these 70 weeks, okay? And those weeks are, are actually seven-year periods, okay? And so what happens is he, he prophesies about these 70 weeks for the, for the Jewish people, okay? And 70 times 7 is 490, so we know that there's 700, or 490 uh, years that Daniel prophesies about. Well, if we look in the Old Testament and we look at world history, we know that of those 490 years, 483 of them have already occurred. And so if you've been paying even the slightest bit of attention during our study of Revelation, you would understand that 490 minus 483 is seven years. And so there is another seven-year time period that is supposed to occur for the nation of Israel and for other things to occur. Well, that seven-year time period is the tribulation. Okay? Is everybody following me? 
Daniel has prophesied saying there's going to be 490 years that are going to happen. And when you look and, and, and read the book of Daniel and understand what he prophesies on and you do the math, there's a missing seven years somewhere. But when you look at the prophecies of Daniel and understand how they match up with the prophecies in Revelation, you understand that those seven years are the seven years of the tribulation. Stacy, will you go to the first slide, the, the timeline for us? And so you'll see that as we go through this, if you read that particular uh, chapter that I'm asking you to read, chapter 13, in your black book, in your commentary, what you'll read is that basically it, it explains it in better detail than I did in like two minutes here. Uh, it explains that that seven years of the tribulation are the final seven years of Daniel's prophecy from the book of Daniel. It's chapter 9 and I think chapter 7. But it's definitely chapter 9. And so I would encourage you to very strongly to read chapter 13 in the black book so that it better explains it than I did just now. But that is the Reader's Digest version of it. That's the, the condensed version of it. That that's what he's, what he's trying to explain to us in here, how the book of Daniel from you know all those years ago 2,500 years ago relate to the prophecies of the book of Revelation. And so I would encourage you to read that uh, because it explains it a whole lot better than I did right there. But that is, the, in a nutshell, what, what he's talking about there. So that is the end of our uh, study tonight in Revelation chapter 5.